welcome. <laughs> um, excuse, I have a, I'm at the tail end of a summer cold, so I sound like a frog and also spontaneously erupt into massive coughing fits. So I beg your pardon immediately. Um, but I, I'm, my name is uh, Daisy Levy. I'm a senior professorial lecturer in the writing studies program and Department of Literature. And I am here today with <laughs> Kelly Joyner, who is a Hearst senior lecturer uh, and also the director of the writing studies program. And Jermaine Jones, a professorial lecturer also, and my office mate um, also in the writing studies program. And we are, um, Jermaine and I are members of the Writer as Witness Committee. <laughs> and we are here to share a little bit with you about this um, fairly unique program that we do here. Um, welcome to AU, I should say that right off the bat. Uh, we're awfully glad you're here. And I'm we're sure, uh, you know, I, we were all remembering new faculty orientation of our own and remembering it was a day of being talked at you know, getting lots and lots of information. Um, and I I expect now it's mostly on Zoom or all on Zoom. And so you we certainly understand and empathize and really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. So I'm going to share my screen. Hang on one second. Mm-mm. Okay. Uh and um I wanna take just a just our, our sketch of the of the um session is a sort of information session, but also a, a chance to talk amongst yourselves and with us about some particular things um, related to this Writer's Witness series. Um, and hopefully you'll come away with some ideas about, um, come about, come out with some ways you might think about using this book um, this fall. And, um, you know, I know it's next, this fall is next week, which is a shock to all of us. Um, but this is a, a program that ha that takes place every year. The Writer's Witness program is a community reads program or a, or a one book, one community program. It gets called it's those kinds of tags um, float around the ether. Um, it's sponsored by the Writing Studies program, which is a program within the Department of Literature and covers the Writing Studies program um, is in charge of of um running all of the first year writing courses um that AU students are required to take and almost all AU students take two semesters of first year writing I won't get too much into that but just so you have a sense of like it's it's um it's a part of the AU core it's and this program exists alongside that uh those courses um Every year, our committee picks a text, one text. We have a couple criteria for picking a text, and those criteria are that it has to be fairly recent. Um, it must be a trade book, so not an academic monograph. Um, it should focus on contemporary issues and themes of a whole range of issues and themes, and it typically incorporates research with lived experience. So all that to say, it is nonfiction. These are not fic works of fiction that we teach. Um, that book then um, is incoming students are notified about the book and are asked to start reading it or be prepared to start reading it as um, at the beginning of the semester. And that book itself gets integrated into the writing studies courses that I mentioned earlier, all of the first year writing courses. Um, often AUX or AU experience courses also make use of the book. And um, I completely lost my train of thought. If you aren't familiar with AUX, that's sort of like a first year experience course and students, AU students take two semesters of that also, one in the fall and one in the spring. 
Um, but in addition to reading the book, using the book in their writing classes, we also do this really extraordinary thing, which is we bring the, we host the writer on our campus for a full day of events. And that the writer meets with writing studies faculty, meets with the honors program, meets, uh, uh, and then um, we ho host a evening event, which is an interview of the writer, interview with the writer, um, but also half of that half of that time is dedicated to a Q and A period for students to ask questions of the writer, um, and this has been a super uh, super exciting event. Pretty much every year, it's um, we hold it in Bender Arena. All first year writing students are invited to attend. It's typically packed. Um, with the exception of our of our online COVID years, that was we did it on Zoom, but that's we're now doing it back in person, which is really great. Um, and it's for many of our students, it's the first time they've sort of brushed up against a real life published writer, um, and a a notable published you know a, a writer whose book is really who's in the ether, who's who's uh, people are talking about this book, and it's it's quite invigorating. Um, it's always, uh, it's just great fun. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about the Writer's Witness program, we also sponsor an essay contest. There are a couple of other um, sort of side things that happen with this series. You're welcome to check out this website. And I realize you can't click on your screen right now. Uh, but if you just go into the American website, American.edu website and search for what writer is witness, the page will come right up. So this year's book is Why Didn't We Riot? Um, a Black Man in Trump Land by Isaac Bailey. And we're really excited about this book. Um, one of us, Jermaine, has actually used this book a number of times in his classes and um, so has a long has a history with uh ways to incorporate the material in the book, the book itself, um, the issues in the book into, into his various classes. And I'm sure he'll have something to share with you about that later. Sorry to put you on the spot, Jermaine. Um, but he's, you know, Isaac Bailey is an accomplished writer. He's an accomplished speaker. He, uh, I, I'm not going to read the slide to you, but he is, you know, he has, uh, he has plenty, plenty of accomplishments under his belt. And he also brings a really particular personal um, and heavily researched story narrative of um, his life experience in the United States, um, but also sort of putting that into conversation with, um, I, I feel okay saying, putting that into conversation with other Black people's experience in the United States, um, Black folks, maybe particularly Black men, maybe particularly Black men in the South. In any case, it is, um, it's a, it's my, my sort of off the cuff assessment of the book is it's deeply accessible. It's very easy to read, but it's also very difficult to read. It's painful. There's some really um, unpleasant truth in there, uh, but that's part of what makes it so important. And that's part of why we chose it because um, it is definitely so relevant. Jermaine, did I miss anything that I should say at this beginning, at this point? No, I think you're you're certainly on target at this point. Okay, thank you. So what we'd like to do next is um, stop talk. We're going to stop talking and ask you to chat with each other. And I am going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you all. Um, you know, we we haven't talked at you a whole lot right now because we just wanted to you to be able to talk to each other, <laughs> honestly. Um, so we have, what do we have? 10 people, nine people. Yeah, Jermaine, do you think we ought to just stay all together? Yeah, I actually just raised my, my hand. Um, I was gonna say we may can, um, because of the numbers just stay, stay together. But there is one question I wanted um, to ask. Um, uh, Oh, and congrats, everyone, um, and welcome to AU. 
um, has there is, is there anyone who has read the text or a uh, portion of the text or, or or is there anyone who's familiar with the, with the book? Like a few. Yeah. Why don't we um if if it's okay, why don't we all just stay together in one in one group? I think this is a nice size. And um first let's hear from everybody. Who are you? Where are you from? Where are you joining us to? Well, like what department are you in or what uh what's your position? What's what's happening? And if it's okay with you, I'll just call on somebody I don't know. Sarah, do would you mind introducing yourself to us? Sure. Um, I was having trouble with my mic earlier. Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, I'm Sarah Gilchrist. I'm a new instruction librarian at the American University Library. I'm going to be working with the School of Public Affairs and um, the School for International Service, graduate students specifically. Um, and I've gotten about Halfway through the book, I've been reading it on my commute down. I live in Baltimore, so, and I lived in South Carolina, so this book has some very personal touches. Yeah. Does it does it feel familiar in any ways? It feels very familiar as somebody who moved down there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With the, familiar with the area, I guess I should say. Yeah. Awesome. Um, can I call on somebody else? Yes, that would be great. All right, I'm going to call on Rob. Okay, thanks so very, very much. I'm not going to put my picture on because I'm not sure my, I work off of iPads, so I'm not sure it's going to be able to take it uh, extremely well. But I'm Rob Engel, and I'm a, a full-time professor now at uh, the School of Public Affairs. I have for a long time been an adjunct uh, with SPA as well. I teach mostly courses on politics, uh, elections and voting behavior, Congress and legislative behavior, American political parties. And I'm also very focused on disability issues, being a disability, being a professor with disabilities. So we are starting at the university. We're starting a center on the study of disability advocacy, education, and civic engagement. And we're making some progress on that at this point in time with announcements that will be coming very, very soon uh, at this point. So my whole focus is really on uh, teaching politics, teaching SPA politics. Um, I went to American University. Uh, I started a program called the Campaign Management Institute years ago there. Uh, I spent a, a lot of time working in politics uh, for the Democratic Party, uh, as well as uh, working up to be the executive director of the Democratic National Committee as well. So um, my background is uh, teaching and I've been teaching in the university since the Campaign Management Institute in the, get ready for it, in the 80s. So the bottom line is it's been a long period of time. Uh, and I find that my responsibility to my students at this point in time is to give them the same opportunities that the university and that politics has given me directly. So that is my story. So hopefully uh, that is good. And next up, I should kick it to, I'm trying to see who else is here. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Oh, wait, wait hold on a second. Continues my participants. Um, can I kick it to Kelly? Kelly, your co host. Hi. I can't kick it to you. Yes. Absolutely. Thank okay, you, there Rob. you go. Uh, thank you. Nice to meet you virtually, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm the director of the Writing Studies Program, and Jermaine and Daisy are. Um, our wonderful uh, representatives from the committee that that uh, helped cho uh, choose this book and put this on. So, um, yeah, I've been at AU since 2000, um, and um, I just started as director in July. So, learning new things every single day and learning ways to do things and not do things. Um, but yeah, it's it's been an adventure so far. Looking forward to uh, the first day of class, though. Uh, can I kick it to Clarissa? All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Clarissa Ison. I'm the science librarian. Um, I also work in the library. I cover all of the sciences, including psychology and health studies. 
Um, so if that happens to be where you are, I am your librarian. Um, and I did read the whole book because I'm a librarian and I like to read. Um, next, how about Bridget? Hello. Um, so I'm Bridget Trogdon. I am new faculty. So with new faculty orientation, but I've been on the job for eight weeks already. Um, if you don't know, so I'm, I'm the new Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Supports. So, um, but I've been a professor for 19 years. My doctorate is in chemistry, but I am a liberal artist first, um, which is why I like working broadly across undergraduate education. And I wanted to come to this session because Kelly and Daisy reached out um, with regard to the Writer's Witness Program. I know there are some things coming up. We're actually talking next Wednesday. Um, I have not read the book yet, but in no way is that a, you know, Bridget won't because Bridget reads a lot. Um, and so the, you know, I, I'm looking forward to this, you know, I got a chance to engage with some of the new faculty as well yesterday, like, like Sarah, um, I've spent the last, um, well, like Sarah, I've gotten to talk to her. Um, so I spent the last 18 years of my career in, uh, Georgia and in South Carolina. And so, um, the, the topic I think is especially interesting and like you, like you cannot live in Macon, Georgia and not talk about race every single day. And, you know, I'm still learning like everybody else, um, but want to be able to bring the students along for the ride. Oh, I've got to call on somebody. Uh, who has not gone? Keisha? Hi. <laughs> I'm Keisha. Let me get my camera. I can get my camera to work. That's okay. We can hear you fine. Okay, great. My name's Keisha, and I'm from Jamaica originally, and I'm completing my PhD in philosophy at Marquette University, and I'm an instructor in the philosophy department where I'll be teaching ethical reasoning and moral philosophy. And uh, my work centers on this concept I'm calling linguistic identity. So what does it mean to be defined by a language or participate in a particular language community? And in particular, linguistic barriers to healthcare in the United States. I have not read the book, but I'm very interested in the book and I'm planning to read it this weekend. Oh, Keisha, Keisha slipped out. Oh. Yes, I have to call in someone. <laughs> I'm sorry. It looks like Kalia may be the only one left. Okay, Kalia, there you go. That's perfect because my sister's name is Keisha. So I'm used to Keisha and Kalia going together. <laughs> um, my name is Kalia Jenkins. I'm starting uh, in COGOD in the marketing department. Um, and uh, I I uh, just I just graduated from the University of South Florida down in Tampa back in May. Um, I did read the book. Very interesting read. Um, my area of research is actually looking at race and marketing. So for me, this was right up my alley. Um, I thought it was an interesting evolution of the author. Um, I, 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 it's, it was a point that was really interesting to me is that um, he specifically went to a non-African American church. Um, which one of the jokes that my pastor always says is, if you want to uh, find the most segregated day in America, it's Sunday. Um, and so um, when he talks about, you know, even how when he started getting more into the race stuff, like even his church, people started to alienate him. Um, I, you know, there's just so much inside of there about the intersectionality of of Christian religion and race and all that stuff. So it was a very, very interesting read. Uh, definitely enjoyed the book. Awesome. Um, it looks like we have someone who's just joined us, Chen. Um, all we are doing is introducing ourselves, giving us giving a, everybody a sense of where you're where you're coming from or what department you're in, etc. Would you mind? Yes. Hello. Uh, hi everyone. Sorry. Um, uh, my I have to keep my voice a little bit low because I have a younger one napping just right next door. Um, yeah, hi, I'm a new faculty member uh, at Kogan School of Business. Um, I'm in the area of management. Uh, I do um, research in 
human resources, personal selection, stuff like that. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically about me. Thank you, Chen. I'm sorry I didn't mean to put you on the spot when you have a napping no problem. person. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I was just when when, when you when I yeah. heard you saying saying like, oh, we're gonna introduce ourselves and stuff like that, I ran to the door and shut it and <laughs> try to open up my window blind but failed. So it's a little dark. But anyways, yeah, I'm ready. No worries. No worries at all. <laughs> um Ch Chaz. If if I don't if you don't mind, all we've done um, so far is just gone around and introduced ourselves. I wonder and and um, a little bit about what what community within AU you're joining and um, whether or not you've had a chance to read or start reading the Why Didn't We Riot book. Would you mind saying a, saying a couple words? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Chaz Brooks. Um, I'm joining the Washington College of Law uh, to co-direct a clinic on uh, entrepreneurship law, mainly working with nonprofits and small businesses in the DMV area. Um, I've been in D.C. about uh, 12 years, uh, spent time at a fellowship at Georgetown um, and had practiced law um, in D.C. Uh, before joining the, the faculty here. Um, I unfortunately did not get a chance to start reading, um, but happy to be a part of the conversation. Uh, awesome. So I, I think feel like at this point, I kind of want to stop being the one who's doing all the talking and ask either Kelly or Jermaine to jump in and fire away with some discussion questions to get us started. Would that be OK? Um, OK, sure. So um, and uh, let me get this off my screen. So welcome to um, everyone who just popped in. Um, Again, my name is Jermaine Jones. I'm actually um, uh, one of the professors, well, one of the committee members, uh, writers of witness committee mem members that help select these texts. Um, I am a professor, um, I'm actually dual literature department and um, writing studies. So um, I just wanna shift the conversation with this text. Um, Daisy, I don't, I don't know if you wanna highlight, well, we can just, I was gonna say you can highlight the slides, but. I just want to make reference to a, a few things, to one or two things. Um, some of you covered this um, already. Um, this text is is basically um, it's much needed in the spaces that we work in right now, just in the country. Um, and this this is one of those texts that just bleeds black truth, and it it's it's the way that Isaac Bailey. Um, the way that he narrates this story, um, it's actually it's not it's not demanding right to read, but it's it's super truthful. Um, and I just want you guys to be thinking about maybe maybe two to three questions that you 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 could actually start um, that will help assist in brainstorming ideas to um, to merge this within your pedagogy. Um, one thing that I do is, um, and I'll speed and I, I won't take a long time, guys. But one thing that I do is. Um, all my classes, um, my African American lit class, my writing studies, uh, writing for social equity class. Um, when I introduce this text, I have a discussion with my students about um, experiences, personal experiences, and we just have we go into this discussion about um, individual experiences, right? And I talk about how the black experience is not monolithic at all, right? The black experience it's diverse, you know. Um, and a lot of that can depend, it, it can depend on uh, geographics, like where you're located and things like that, family dynamic, whatever the case may be, even, even skin complexion, right? But um, we have this discussion about experiences and I, and I underscored to my students that this is Isaac, ba Isaac Bailey's truth. This is his black truth. This is his experience. And at some point, you know, think about his experience and place it against the backdrop of your own. So that when we are done with the, with the text and we, we are on the other side, we can have like a like a diverse discussion about things we didn't know about particular people and and, and particular races and um, and some of the historical uh, traumas um, that are somewhat um, genetically transmissible, right? Um, so be thinking about those questions, but I'm just going to go through this. So here's a quote that uh, from from the text that sticks out to me. 
Um, and I'm just going to read the quote and I'll, and I'll go through my points and then I'll kick it over to, uh, to uh, Kelly um, and Daisy. So one thing that I love that Bailey does is in this piece, he's super honest and transparent. Um, and, um, and, 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 and when I read the piece, there were certain bits and pieces that I actually thought I wrote myself. That's just how much I was able to connect to what he was writing. But this piece, this piece here, um, tell me, Bailey says, I'm sorry, <laughs> let me tell you what I am, right? I am a broken man with a broken past who fears his, who fears he's inevitably headed toward a broken future. I don't want your pity though. Um, Bailey, he says, uh, don't need you to believe I'm a forever victim, forever licking his wounds and cursing his pain. I'm not. I know how to handle challenges, overcome obstacles. I've spent a lifetime perfecting the craft. Um, that's what being Black in America requires. Um, and part of that is Black success is accompanied by nightmares. These are all, these, what he's articulating here, this is just, one of the grassroots elements of black existence, right? Um, and 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 from this, he underscores that with being black comes various types of trauma. And the other thing I like that he does um, with this piece, um, um, I think Bridget mentioned um, some uh, living in Georgia, or and, and someone else mentioned. Um, sorry, I can't think of your name right now. Um, living in South Carolina. And I think if I'm from DC, but my mother lives in the South in North Carolina. And I do understand that um, there's, there's, there's sort of, in terms of racism in the South, um, there's this contemporary racism that Bailey focuses on. Um, oh, Susan, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, there's this contemporary racism that Bailey details. Um, and it's, it, it, it's somewhat um, anachronistic, right? It's almost like this, the racism that Bailey describes, it's from a different period. It's from, it's from a different time frame. It's from the 50s and 60s and uh, 1800s and things like that. Um, so what I do is the first thing I do um, um, is I have that discussion with my students about experiences. And then I take a historical approach. I talk about um, black literature and I just go through, even with the vernacular tradition in terms of black literature, which is basically music, right? Um, and I just talk about how um, if we were to um, go through and decode um, um, black literature from, um, you know, even even um, pre Harlem Renaissance. If we look at the literature, and we take a look at the vernacular tradition. Everyone is saying the same thing, decade after decade after decade, right? Um, um, and and why is that? And the other thing we do is we take we scrutinize evangelical Christianity traditions in North and South. And Bailey talks about how basically. Um, um, Christianity in the South is basically, um, in so many words, um, um, being radically remade, right? And he equates evangelicalism um, to um, republicanism, and he 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 and he goes into this whole thing about um, how these two forces create a movement um, that's it's not about politics or religion at all. It's about white patriarchal power, right? Um, and then we go into the whole psychological raising part. Um, Bailey does a great job of, of, of highlighting so many, um, you know, valid stories and, and truths um, about, you know, violence and, and, and policing and, and the media. And, 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 and we had this discussion and we take a deep, deep dive and we look at um, um, actual examples of um, how the media assassinates um, black, uh, folks of color multiple times um, after the physical killing. Um, and demonizes and weaponizes black culture and typecasts and, and stereotypes black, you know, black culture. And the last thing I talk about, um, the law folks in the room are probably familiar with the term the Rashomon effect. Um, and this basically, I do this because um, I want students to understand that white America has decade after decade attempted to not believe, and that should be racism, I'm sorry, that racism exists. Um, so, I, so I give an example um, of the Rashomon effect um, and how, um, with via black literature um, and the black um, um, vernacular tradition through the music where um, the plea is being made through um, through literature, you know, the black plea. Um, but for some reason, um, America doesn't um, receive it. 
Um, so throughout history, there've been, there've, uh, there've been uh, times where, um, for example, um, the Carnegie um, Institute up in New York and other places, they've contracted out social scientists and, and therapists from other countries and even you know, domestically to do research on um, racism in America, um, opposed to listening to folks from the Harlem Renaissance and all these great writers and bell hooks and uh, ISIS papers and um, Wesleyan and all these folks. Ellis Coast, Cornell West, um, and they and and they get these um, 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 white males to do research on on racism. Um, one in particular, Gunnar Murdahl did one did a study in the South. Um, uh, it was published in forty four. And 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 what's interesting is interesting about his about that research was that he went to the South. He 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 became what he was studying, and it, and he and 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 the plight, the contradiction. Um, the piece is called American Denial the book in the film, it literally almost physically killed him um, um, be, uh, being consumed by um, 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 racism. So um, I just think that was a waste and, and it's been a waste in my eyes. Um, um, we don't need anyone to come do research on what folks have been telling you um, decade after decade. So these are some of the approaches I take. I won't, I'll, 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 I'll um, leave it here. Um, um, and feel free to email me or reach out if you want to have a discussion or further discussion or talk about other things, um, um, you know, other methods I may, I may take to, to, to use this book and implement it in my pedagogy. Um, but also be thinking about those, those questions as well. Um, Kelly, David, you guys want to. Thank you, Jermaine. Um, Daisy, if you want to put my slide up. I just had a couple of minutes to to talk about a, a particular passage. The book resonates with me in a whole bunch of different ways, but um, there was one passage that made it reson resonate for me. Um, just thinking about the whole writer's witness program. So I think we're on our twenty uh, fifth book. Uh, maybe this is the 26th book. So we've been doing this for that many years. Um, but five years ago, we had a book by um, Arlie Russell Hochschild. And what um, Bailey had to say on pages 69 and 70 made me think of our choice of Hochschild's book. So I'll read this and then I'll talk some more. So he writes, I'll tell you why they, meaning white evangelicals, turn to Trump because Christianity as practiced in America has never been incompatible with white supremacy. Pretending that they turn to him because of a supposed economic angst, which black people in Trump land suffer from far more than white people here, or because they feel their religious rights are under attack, even as they feel comfortable with the, uh, with the racial inequities in their midst from which they daily benefit, helps no one. That's why it grates on me, Bailey writes. That's why it grates on me like little else to hear white liberals and moderates commit to honoring the voices of white people in Trump land while telling black people to just shut up and take it. Um, I think, I mean, if, if we're teaching this book in our classes, that's that's rife for, for discussion in the classroom. So we, we assigned five years ago uh, Arlie Rush, Russell Hochschild's book, Strangers in Their Own Land, um, and Hope Shield um, is a writer anthropologist uh, from Berkeley, California, and, and she she wanted to take as a project um, to try to understand why um, working class white people in the South were voting against their own interests, voting for um, Republicans who were sort of against environmentalism, who were making their lives economically harder, um, who were just damaging their lives in ways um, that maybe they understood or maybe they didn't understand. Anyway, so she went down and she embedded herself in a community in Louisiana for uh, a few years and got to know the people and then she reported back. Um, but her, her project was to, as Bailey says, honor the voices of white people in Trump land. Um, so, so we could ask ourselves, is there is there a line over which, so when does healthy dialogue cross the line over into 
maybe abetting white supremacy. We can talk about First Amendment. We could talk about free speech. We could talk about cancel culture. Um, but to what extent are um, liberals and moderates, white liberals and moderates, sort of exacerbating situations? And to what extent do we do we need to to listen to um, people who vote for Trump and try to understand them? So that stood out for me. Uh, I'll kick it back to Daisy. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I, you know, I want to apologize again for those who just um, arrived after I said I'm at the tail end of a cold, and so I am periodically overcome with massive cough coughing. So I really. I'm trying to minimize the amount of time I talk, but it's not working because I'm a chatty Cathy. Um, but I, I want to, I guess, um, what what I'll, I'll offer my, you know, half a cent, um, and and then pose a you know pose a question back to you guys, which is that you know for me for me this book feels urgent, um, given our current situation in this country with. Um, it, you know, it, my field is rhetoric, so the word that we use is chirotic. Um, urgent is also a good word. <laughs> um, the ways in which education um, and America's history is getting criminalized, um, and it, uh, it among uh, among other things happening in the country, but in particular to to have to sort of focus on and emphasize a book written by a black man um, who has, and 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 emphasizing his authority, the authority, what am I trying to say? Uh, he speaks, he speaks with his, with authority on his experience um, rather than talking about, like sort of like what Jermaine was talking about, bringing other people here to study racism in America, which is, weird but that's <laughs> i'm getting on a tangent um seems very important to me it seems crucially important to me also um american as a predominantly white institution i feel we have a, a i feel a kind of urgency in the kind of responsibility that our institution can take um not being a state education state uh funded um institution um we got to talk about the stuff. Um, and I think we have to talk about it well. That's that's where I'm coming from. Uh, so the one of the ways that uh, that I that I plan on using it, obviously, I haven't taught it yet because we're just getting ready to start the semester. But uh, something I focus on in my writing classes is what I call critical listening or reflective listening. <laughs> And trying to develop our our listening skills as much as our speaking skills. Our speaking skills are important. There's no question, but there's little in in my uh, in my estimation in my um, experience. Speaking without also listening gets you in a whole mess of trouble, um, and uh, so that's a that's a fundamental part of the class. We do this throughout the semester with a number of different kinds of texts, with a number of different kinds of speakers. Um, but we start off the semester with the writer as witness book, and I plan on doing this with Isaac Bailey's book too, which is to um, have students reflect, sort of examine themselves as the reader of the book, and to think about who they are and what knowledge they have, what knowledge they're bringing to the text, what kinds of expectations they have about the text and why they have those expectations, where those expectations come from, um, what uh, what do they think it's going to be like to read it. And then while they're reading it, to be keeping those same kind of reflective notes about what's happening to them as a reader as they are listening to Bailey's words. So what kinds of things are either interfering with their ability to continue to listen to it or things that surprise them, things that um, they did not expect, things that expectations they had that were met and what what not just what those things were, but what kind of impact that has on the way they make meaning from this book. Um, and um, I feel like that's um, really important, not just in terms of developing 
good citizens or good people, um, you know, well-rounded, balanced people, but also good thinkers. Um, and that, I think that speaks to both what Kelly and Jermaine are saying. So I would like to stop talking actually and um, ask if anybody would like to share if you have ways of thinking about using that you could use this book in your classes or in your events that you take part in at AU um, or if you have questions you'd like to ask about ways to incorporate it or to get involved with this book and you're welcome to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and start talking. Thank you, Sarah, for the for the posting that link to guidelines. I, I haven't clicked on them, but I have a I have a guess about what they are. Sort of civility in, in discourse. Is that could you say a little bit about them? Um yeah, we use these in intergroup dialogue okay. when I was facilitating that. And it it's it says it's from the United States Institute of Peace. Um it's basically a way of priming the classroom or priming the space for a discussion because a lot of times, especially when we're talking about things that have a heavy personal and emotional content, um, we have to make space for uncomfortable yeah. feelings. And um, I think that, Jermaine, you were talking about like the passage that you read and, and how you know, it doesn't make sense that we're inviting researchers from outside of the United States to come study racism in the United States when, like, we have people who are talking about it. But I think that our emotions get in the way, and people right now especially are shutting down, and so we can't even have a conversation. And so we have to prime the space to say we're going to have a dialogue. We're going to listen to these voices and like listen to our own voices and accept that it isn't about like proving that you aren't racist <laughs> right um like and i think that this conversation is so i i studied the soviet union my partner studied nazi germany <laughs> we we talk a lot about the ways that society can shift subtly and inexplicably to create like systems and reinforce systems of oppression. Um, and, you know, I, well, first of all, like we go into other people's classes and we teach like a one shot session. I'm gonna be, one of, one of the tenants of librarianship is talking um, voices that are underrepresented in our research. So that we understand we're not just perpetuating the same you know positions and platforms and i think that this is an opportunity for us to kind of have this conversation in multiple places on our campus but we also need to we, we need to be explicit about the fact that this conversation is going to be difficult for a lot of people and that it might it might bring up a lot of things that need to like be unpacked and that we need to have time to sit with. I I think about it as the call coming from inside the house where you're like, oh no, I'm misogynist, even though I'm a woman who's a feminist, you know? Like and that's like one step in a lot of steps that we need to take to even have this conversation. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was kind of rambly, but I've found that these guidelines are are really helpful when I'm trying to teach a new concept in the classroom because it helps us like have something. It's not me telling them what to do; it's something else that we can refer to. Um, I'm so glad that we picked this book. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right, and I, I um. I haven't looked at those guys. I'm sure those guidelines are awesome. Um, they it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. I think too. I know. I most of you are 
with the exception maybe of Rob, are are brand new to AU, I think. And so I, I wonder if um if you're be at whatever past institutions you were at, if you have any uh what am I trying to say? AU is a particular uh Every every institution of higher education is its own particular community with its own uniqueness and its own distinction, right? But I I will say that I have been uh, particularly sort of excited by the AU students um, in the ways that they respond to a lot of these conversations. Not to say that there is not difficulty and conflict because for sure there is but I wonder at, at, there were other institutions that I've taught at where if we were to teach a book like this I would have a great deal more apprehension is what I'm trying to say I would be more more nerve I would be even more nervous I, I wonder if anybody else is feeling I don't know not to not to put a pall over the conversation, but does anybody feel nervous about broaching these kinds of conversations in their you class? You know, I, I I I have so many thoughts with this, and um, part of it, you know, I somebody asked a question yesterday in new faculty orientation that I've just been chewing on for a day or two, and I'm probably not getting it right, and I didn't write it all down, but it was basically how do I learn how to, in the classroom, you know, and, and it wasn't exactly like this, but it was like, use words, use, you know, share, share my own experiences in ways that don't, you know, end up hurting the students on their own trajectories. And that, and, you know, I mean, I said, this is a cisgendered white woman, right? Coming into a classroom, it's really hard to talk about race privilege, you know, all these kind, all, you know, sexism, like, you know, religion, everything in the classroom. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Right. And, um, and, you know, and I've taught first year seminar, first year writing kinds of classes for, you know, 20 years. And um, it really doesn't get easier, but I think it's just, in, what I do sometimes is just be transparent with the students. You know, we're we're all on this intellectual journey, realizing that we do have very different experiences. And AU does bring in so much more diversity than a lot of other institutions in a number of ways. And you know, like we we are still a P P U I or P W I, but barely. You know, and um, and I, I think the fact that AU is <laughs> not only willing but um, it's part of our DNA to engage in important discussions makes me proud to be here. And I, I think those are the things that we need to bring into the classroom as well. Um, is, does anybody else wanna share anything? I, I realize that we are over time. I just looked at the clock and see that it's 3.30 and I think you have something else you have to be at. Um, it's just a discussion with the provost about tenure. You know, it's not important. Oh, that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's super important. And I'm sure you'd like to get to that. Let, uh, so how about, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Are we gonna have, um, I, I know that you probably have talked about this, but I, I would really love to have more like community discussion sessions outside of classes for this book where we could sit like I love talking to students and listening to students and like having that kind of rich discussion is really great mm -hmm. um are I, we're, I know we're gonna have the office we're also gonna have some chances to kind of sit with I would love to do that uh, I don't know. I'm I'm still relatively new at AU myself. This is only my fifth year, um, but I I don't know. In the years that I've been here, we have not had writing program sponsored like book discussion groups or that kind of like like book club type things. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it would be awesome. And I don't actually, uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, I'll write your name down and um, hunt you down and see if we can figure out how to do that without, you know. Maybe we can get the library involved. They can ask around and 
I think it would be I think it would be great and I'd 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 love to partner with with you guys. I mean even if like I could see how like the different people in our university community can yes. different yes. people at different we have the faculty and staff divide that we're trying to bridge, right? Right. So, right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm all I'm all for it. I, I don't exactly know the the quick answer to that, but I'll I'll find you. <laughs> I'll follow up with you next week or the week after, if that's okay, because yeah. I th I think that would be really fun. Hey, it's Rob Engel. I think that would be very helpful. You have to listen listen to be able to write. You have to listen to be able to learn. Yeah, uh, and this is a book that talks about listening. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that takes us out of the student mind and into the community. The community mind, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And to keep have it so it so I, I would like to see, I'm speaking only for myself right now, but I would like for these um the books that we pick to become things that uh they certainly are part of our writing curriculum, but to sort of spread out and and um get people to engage with each other in lots of different ways so i'm all for it affinity groups yeah it would be great bridget um i'm i'm sorry now i'm super scattered and i'm distracted about trying to make sure you guys get to your tenure discussion with the provost um, so if it's okay with everyone i will close on behalf of my co-facilitators and say thank you so much um please feel free to hit any of us up for anything uh, welcome again to the community and i um, hope you have a terrific rest of your day thank you very much i'm just waiting to make sure they all get the link they need which i think they're good rob do you know where you're going I have to be honest with you, I don't. Um, do you know if you're tenure line or term? I'm term. Then you want to click that top link. Uh, the top link. Do you see my... Uh, in, in, the, in the chat? In the chat, yes. Let me repost it for you. Chat. Sorry about that. I'm in the chat. I am reposting it.